Uh, thank you, Dr. Ehler, for one for introduction. I am quite distinguished as a first year infectious disease fellow here at USF. And like he said, uh, today we're going to be talking about um, preventing infectious complication among the hematopoietic stem cell transplant. <coughs> so in order to achieve this, I have really three main goals um, to talk about. The first goal is really use this as an introduction, a key emphasis being introduction on just kind of the basic process of the transplant. You know, what is involved, what are some indication, you know, what does it take? Next, understanding, um, focusing sometimes on the phases of opportunistic infection because that will help us get a better idea of, okay, depending on which phases there are, that's when patients are at certain risk for certain type of infection. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. <coughs> and finally, talking about really, again, introduction to some of the common prophylaxis practice. Uh, some of this is based on guidelines. Some of this is based on, you know, what we do um, after stem cell transplant. So that's the three main goals. So how do we go about doing this, the outline? So first, I'd like to talk a little bit about the history, the transplant history, how to get started, where it was, where we, a little bit about where we are now, and not so much on where we'll be going. Then the overview of the process. Again, talking about, you know, what does it take for somebody to undergo a stem cell transplant? What are some of the indication? Next, the different phases of opportunistic infection. And we'll, we'll, we'll again emphasize the d three different phases on which we go through. Um, and then we're going to break it down to bacterial, viral, fungal, and other infection. More so really looking at toxo and tuberculosis. And then, of course, a quick little summary slide, um, kind of looking at hopefully some learning points or take-home points. So before we start with the history, though, apparently there's a prehistory, which I didn't even know about. I was like, prehistory? What? So apparently, I mean, not apparently, people, people have looked into this. This is true fact, not, not false. <laughs> um, one of the first documented bone marrow transplant was written in an 8th century, 8th century Irish epic tale called the, the Tain, or otherwise known as the Tain Bowl Coulange. Pardon me if I'm mispronouncing a lot of these words. Uh, it was based on an Ulster warrior by the name of Seathern. And what happened? So he's a warrior. What do warriors do? They fight. And then what happens? You get a lot of injury. And apparently, there is um, a kind of, uh, think of it as like an on-field medic, who, who then took bone marrow from various animals and then injected into our warrior. What happened? The warrior survived to fight another day. Yes. <laughs> Only to die, succumb to his battlefield injury. So the epic tale says. Okay. Let's get to the meat of the history. When did it start? 1940s. We think of this 1940s as, as the modern stem cell. Why? Well, something pretty big happened in the 40s. This thing called World War II, and more specifically, nuclear radiation, right? The nuclear bomb. So some of the scientists are thinking, ah, Cold War, nuclear bomb. Let me start thinking of ways to prevent you um, the human body from getting all these lethal dose of radiation. So what they did, some of the research they did is they uh, shielded mice spleens and femur from lethal radiation. And then they even took other mice that wasn't exposed to radiation, took their bone marrow and injected to the mice that had lethal radiation. You know, obviously bench research, basic science, they, they got some learning points from it. But it wasn't really until the 1950 when you start having the first human marrow. And that was done by um, Dr. Do Donald Thomas and colleague. And it was first done in leukemic patients, actually. And what do you do? Basically, irradiate everybody with leukemia. <coughs> then use, take bone marrow from other non-leukemic patients and then transplant it. What happened? Not much. Basically, you had graft failure was the most common uh, response, and you also have transient uh, take on the graft. Mind you, we haven't talked anything about immunology, 
Well, we know that with successful bone marrow transplant, a lot of it has to do with HLA typing, specifically, or other word, otherwise known as human leukocyte antigen, right? You want to have good histocompatibility. Well, we didn't understand about histocompatibility until the 1960s, where we understand about the antigen. We now more exposed to the idea of graft-first-host disease, which I'll talk a little bit about what that is, understanding about post-transplant immunosuppression, Im immunosuppression and then, you know, so that you're, you don't have graft versus host disease. 1970s. So what has happened? Some scientists, you know, radiated some mouse, injected some bone marrow. Then there was some human, and now you understand about histocompatibility. So kind of the next logical step is, okay, let's create a bone marrow repository, right? And that's what IBMTR, otherwise known as the International Bone Marrow Transplant repository found in 1972, one of the first one where you can start pooling all these bone marrow. And not to be a side note, but this is also during the 70s was also when this chemical compound called DMSO, which some of you may be familiar with, is a cryopreservant. That was also discovered in the 70s. So now you have a repository and you have a mean to kind of preserve them better. You understand the histocompatibility. What's next? Well, now you start getting more and more indication for a transplant. You start understanding getting more drugs, understanding uh, more donor, creating more donor pool, not only from in England um, with uh, the European Registry, uh, the no and then there's a North American marrow donor pool. So now you're getting more and more. 1990s, new regimen. Now, we've been talking about, well, bone marrow, so bone marrow from the femur, from your hip, but now you can also think about peripheral blood stem cell as another potential source. So the 1990s, you start thinking using that. Then you start, if you're going to use peripheral blood stem cells, then you're going to need something, some drug to help stimulate that. That's where granulocyte colony stimulating factor, aka neupogen, the term that we normally hear, think of, that came into being as well. Well, 2000 and really should be 2000 and beyond, right? So the outcomes are getting better now, right? Patients are getting um, the age for transplant are moving. So now you can do it in older patients because now you have better immunosuppressive regimen. And now we start now in the 2010s, you start using more and more umbilical cord, which is a different type rather than just blood stem cell, uh, peripheral blood or bone marrow. You start thinking about umbilical cord, which gives you even more indication. And then um, you start. So uh, and also the idea of cell therapy. So what does it all mean, right? Well, essentially, uh, Nifio and all in 2008, he presented this data, and what he saw, what he said is that American by the time they're 70, one in 217 American would have had undergone stem cell transplant. So it doesn't seem like a lot, but if you think about it, that's actually th th that number is going to get larger and larger. So whether you're a primary care provider or infectious disease specialist, we're going to be exposed to these patients. So we got to know a little bit of, well, what it happened. I mean, no, you don't need to be a specialist, but you should have a general idea, which is one of the goal I said for this presentation. So then what are some of the indications for stem cell transplant? So we look at this diagram and, you know, like back in the medical school days, you know, the blood stem cell separate myeloid lymphoid, etc. And if there's any abnormality in any of this, that can cause a problem. So potentials, I mean, leukemia, lymphoma, myeloperiphery disorder, myelodysplastic syndrome, bone marrow, congenital immune deficiency, you know, common variable immune deficiency to George, enzyme deficiencies, and hemoglobinopathies. These are some of the common indications for stem cell transplant. So somebody is unfortunately have one of this disease. How do you go about approaching them for stem cell transplant? Well, you got to kind of evaluate them. Well, what do you do? Well, first you got to evaluate the disease. You know, how severe is the disease? Is it in remission status? Because remember stem cell transplant, it's, it's a elective procedure, right? So you, you've you already taken care of their disease, either put, essentially put in remission, or if they fail, have refractory, and then you, you go on to stem cell. So you got to evaluate them also physiologically, right? The couch potato or the woman doing the cartwheel? You like the woman doing the cartwheel. Not to say that that's a criteria, but it means that 
they are um, one of the term you're going to hear about um, is called Karnofsky performance status, which you may have already been familiar with. The higher the number, that means that the greater the um, they are uh, physical physiologically um, able to undergo a regimen, which is what's the goal? You're basically getting a regimen that nuke their whole bone marrow, right? To wipe them a clean slate, so you can get new cell. I mean, so you can then transfuse new stem cell. So you look at the pulmonary, the cardiac, the hepatic, the renal. Because somebody with a COPD, you know, underlying lung infection, come in, get infection, say aspergillus, uh, that's not going to be so fantastic versus somebody who doesn't have underlying COPD. Okay, infection screening, right? We, I got to talk about infection because that's what we do, right? Well, <coughs> you got to screen them for infection because <coughs> it's kind of like the certain idea attending of mine that always says hypgia. Never understood what that is, but he says, had it once, got it, wait, had it before, got it again, right? So it's the same idea that you always got to look at, right, Dr. Tony? Um, yeah, and le last but not least, you always got to remember to look at the patient as a whole. Look at their psychosocial support. Are they ready to undergo this process, right? Um, and then you got to see, do they have enough of a support group? Granted, really, the role we play, admittedly, is really just the infection screening. A lot of the other roles are mainly played by the hematologist oncologist. So, infection screening. So we screen the donor, and we'll talk a little bit, then the donor could either be, you know, if I have leukemia, could the donor could either be me or could be from somebody else. Well, what are some infections that we screen for? When you're screening for infection, um, I'll get this, essentially it's a laundry list here. Things that we think about, we think about in terms of prevalence and severity, right? So you gotta say the prevalence, okay? How widespread is the condition, the likelihood of that disorder? Because now that we recognize that the bone marrow the registry could be any in North America, you know, could be here in the U.S., could be in Europe, you know, just because I have it doesn't mean it's somebody next door who's going to be the donor. It could be somebody from far away. So you got to look at their risk and say, okay, well, in that area where they're at, say, you know, Europe or wherever, are they at increased risk for, say, transmiss transmissible spongiform encephalopathy? Because then you may have to consider that. The one on the left column, those are more common, so you screen that more regularly um, in donor. So we talk about donor screening. Well, donor could be other donor, so allogeneic or autologous. So we're going to talk a little bit about allogeneic. So basically what you do is there's a term called harvesting. It sounds kind of scary. It makes you think of these alien movies where you're harvesting your organ. But in a way, what you're harvesting is you're harvesting the donor stem cell. So how does it work? There's several ways. If you're doing bone marrow, then the donor would undergo either regional or general anesthesia, you know, and then from the bone marrow, there's a needle and not so fantastic. They suck out the stem cell. It gets processed. Algae. If it's peripheral blood, they usually get, you know, some kind of um, <coughs> granulocyte colony stimulating factor, <coughs> simulate the cells, the donor that undergoes, you know, a apheresis to suck out the cell, then gets processed, put a DMSO for a cryopreservant, and then when the patient's ready, you infuse it. <coughs> okay, allogeneic, autologous, essentially the same idea, right? Except now you're using your own donor cell, and usually it's more so from the peripheral blood stem cell. And it's usually used in recurrent non-Hodgkin lymphoma or Hodgkin lymphoma or multiple myeloma. And it's really predicated on this idea of if a little bit of chemo is good and can really cure it, then a lot is going to be better. But if a lot is better, that means you're going to wipe out the bone marrow completely. Well, no, that's how I think it, right? So if it, if it wipes out the bone marrow complete, then you have to somehow rescue the, the bone marrow somehow, right? Because you can't just like, well, I cure your leukemia, but now you have, or, you know, him lymphoma, but now you have no white cells to protect you from infection. Well, so then that's when you infuse their own white cells. And we'll talk about what are some of the potential complications of that. So here we are. You're this generic guy or gal, and you unfortunately have lymphoma, leukemia, whatever. Um, and then you present to the hospital. What happens? <coughs> you look great. You're excited. Then you under conditioning regimen, right? What's the, what's the purpose of conditioning regimen? To wipe out your whole bone marrow, right? To nuke it to where you have no more stem cells at all, because then you're going to give the stem cell in. Then you change your clothes and get hooked up to an IV. And now you're getting infusion. <coughs> then 
you recover and you hope that you walk out the same way you came in. That's the goal anyway, but it's never that simple. What are some potential complications? <coughs> the early adverse effect <coughs> is regimen related toxicity, meaning what? Well, whatever the conditioning regimen you're using to nuke those stem cells. Um, and there are, of course, now more reduced regimen toxicity. So reduced regimen intensity. So you might hear that term, RRI, the short. Infection, 8% of infection uh, in autologous um, stem cell, about 8% of the time you suffer from infectious complication. In allogeneic, anywhere between 17 to 20%. And we'll talk a little bit as to why is it a little bit higher for allogeneic, but you probably already have an idea as to why. You're always going to suffer from graft versus host disease, and we'll talk exactly what that means, <coughs> and a graft failure. What are some of the long-term adverse effects? Essentially same. You have acute, you're going to have chronic. You're still going to have infection, and now you may now have some endocrine disturbances, usually thyroid issue. You can always have disease relapse, right? Because, for example, in multiple myeloma or autologous, you're injecting your own cells, so there's always that chance that those your own cells can then often redevelop the cancer again and secondary malignancy, and that's usually related to the regimen, the conditioning regimen. So here we go. This is like the customary slide that anybody who's ever going to talk about, whether it be solid organ, well, you, solid, well, really more so bone marrow, less so solid organ, but okay, so bone marrow I take back. So this is the one that you really, we got to really focus on. So we're going to spend a little bit of time. So this is a model um, that was developed looking at the different phases, essentially broken down the three phases. Phase one, the pre-engraftment, phase two, post, phase three, the late phase. And here it's breaking down to bacterial, viral, fungal, and based on the day. Day zero is your infusion day, infusion of the stem cell. So when you first start in phase one, the pre-engraftment, so before the stem cell actually engraft onto the body, you're now you're just got done with this heavily toxic chemo regimen, right? The conditioning regimen. So what are you at risk for? Your you know, you can get neutropenic because again, neutropenic uh, by definition, you know, severe neutropenia, absolute neutrophil cell count less than 500, and you're getting that because the conditional regimen is to wipe out your whole stem cells. Then you're going to be at risk for infection, usually gram negative, gram positive, gastrointestinal streptococci, gram negative, you, you know, E. coli, pseudomonas, capsiella. You hope it's none of the, you know, CRE, or you hope it's not a cyanotrophomonas that's innately resistant to a lot of organisms. The gram-positive pathogens, usually um, more so um, usually, and remember streptviridans is just a class, it's not a species or anything, it's really strep intermediate, strep oralis, et cetera. And then GI translocation, so that's from the bacteria in the phase one. And that's relating to because the regimen itself causes you to have severe mucositis, you can have GI translocation, um, you can have mucosal barrier breakdown which is why if somebody who has a central catheter, um, catheter device, that can get infected, you know, tr from the skin and soft tissue directly into the bloodstream. Virus-wise, herpes. Um, you can also have respiratory uh, community viruses. So that depends on the season. And that goes back to kind of the infection screening, your history, um, kind of say, okay, well, what season are you in? You know, you're not going to have enteric viruses if you're between the month of, you know, December to February. That's, you can think more influenza. You're not going to think enteric till, say, the summer months. And then fungal, uh, at least in the first phase, you're going to think about aspergillus in Canada. The second phase, right? So really, I, th I kind of combine the second phase and third phase kind of the same, because here at this point, you're on heavily immunosuppressive. You're already engrafted. You're not worried about the white cell, lack of white cells anymore. But you're on heavily immunosuppression to allow for the graft to continue to function, right? So that's what does that do? That's going to impair your cell mediated. That's going to you know, impair your T cells, CD4 count, CD8 cell. That's going to affect your humoral immunity specifically your antibodies, right, your immunoglobulins. So that's why now you start in the viral, you, you may have start reactivation of certain viruses, right, CMV, EBV. Um, you're st you may even start having issue with pneumocystis, kind of the same thing with HIV and low CD4 count. Late phases, we can say about day 100 and beyond. Why encapsulated bacteria? Well, again, it has to do with the fact that 
your immune immunity actually doesn't really come back quickly because it's the memory cells that don't come back. So y you may be producing immunoglobulin, but they're defective immunoglobulin. And so that's why you're at risk for encapsulated bacteria. And for the same, you know, for different reason with the T cell, you're at risk for VZV and also aspergillus and pneumocystis. So what are some of the factors affecting the risk of infection? Well, we, we hint at it, you know, the, the type of transplant, right? We talked that in allogeneic, you're going to be at higher risk than autologous. Why? Because you're going to be during period of greater immunosuppression, an immunosuppressive regimen. The time from transplant, kind of what we talked about in terms of the phase of opportunistic infection. Pre-transplant factor, well, somebody who've had, you know, previous infection, you know, whether it be CRE, uh, C. diff, they can get it again. HLA match. So spend a little time talking a little bit about this. So this is really more so applicable in allogeneic type of transplant because what you're getting now is you're getting somebody else whose um, stem cells who are not yours. So you got to think about, okay, what are the histocompatibility? So you're going to hear terms such as match-related, mismatch, haploidentical. What does it all mean? It, all it really means is the degree of the histocompatibility, uh, sameness, similarity. So match-related, um, usually it's somebody who is your relative, brother and sister who's very similar. So th the greater the HLA match, the less likely are you have having risk of infection because you are at less likely risk of getting GVHD because you don't need to be on immunosuppressive and the disease status. So GVHD, let's talk about GVHD because I keep on mentioning that term. So this is kind of, uh, it is, not kind of, it is a diagram of how the, the pathophys of GVHD and you can think of it in t essentially into three steps. First, you think you have the conditioning regimen we talked about, right? So it affects only the stem cell, but it affects the mucosal area as well, too. So what, it, what does it do? It activates the antigen-presenting cells. And once the antigen-presenting cells are activated, then that activates, the, it's a cascade. It's going to activate the mature donor T lymphocytes, which then activates further more cytokines, such as tumor necrosis factor, IL-1, tumor necrosis factor alpha, IL-1, IL-06, which then mediate even further tissue-specific damage. For example, we know that in GI mucosal GVHD, it's mediated by tumor necrosis factor alpha. So think of, I think of, there's two things to think about GVHD. You got to think of that GVHD is a, essentially a normal, albeit very exaggerated process of inflammation as the donor's um, leukocytes have been infused. And then that you also got to keep in mind that the recipient mucosal has already been, the, underlying, the, the, the underlying's already been damaged by the condition regimen. So they're already starting in a way as a, at a disadvantage. What other factors? The graft type, so again, allogeneic, aut autologous, mismatch, haploidentical, umbilical cord, um, so, th so that's going to cause issues. So um, in somebody with a umbilical cord, their recovery is going to be, takes about four weeks versus somebody who's getting a bone marrow. Recovery, I mean, in terms of the neutrophil engraftment versus somebody who's using um, peripheral blood stem cell. And so this, this chart here kind of, this diagram give us a hint uh, on the vertical axis, looks at imu uh, immune cell count and then the x-axis horizontal is looking at the duration and you can see that it takes one of the first one that comes back right away is your neutrophils and your monocytes and then your the green line which is your b-cell and cd8 that takes months to come back and then it takes years post transplant before everything is kind of normal again and so that plays into that idea of the different phases of uh, uh, opportunistic infection and that's based on how your immune function recover. Okay, so let's kind of get into a little nitty gritty. So we, we, we kind of set up indication, we kind of set up the phases. Let's talk a little about now specific bacteria, viruses, fungal, and other. So bacteria. So this is strep viridin, or one of the group could be strep intermediates, vir uh, oralis, mitis. And these are the ones that we worry about because usually it's in the mucosa. And so we usually start pr antibacterial prophylaxis with fluoroquinolone, Cipro or levofloxacin. 
uh, which one do you choose? Does it matter? Well, if somebody has a history of really bad mucositis in the past or history of strep mitis, um, infection, bacteremia, you might want to err a little bit on levofloxacin because it has better strep coverage than Cipro. You start at the stem cell infusion and then you stop once the neutropenia recover. You need to addition, you know, there's no addition of anti gram positive, other anti gram positive um, agent needed. So, you know, this is slightly different from, you know, we're not really talking about like neutropenic fever. You know, if you're having prolonged neutropenic fever, that's a different story. You might want to add VANG, and that's again, even that's if it's prolonged, et cetera. <laughs> so, thinking back to that one slide with the phase of opportunistic infection, and you remember seeing something called gastrointestinal streptococci. So you're like, okay, so I know that that's a potential bug. Why don't I just go ahead and decolonize it? Just wipe it off. And then that way, it doesn't have the issue later on, right? I mean, you hear that in ventilator-associated pneumonia, all these, you know, decolonizing regimen. Well, the, the reality is there's not that much data, and what limited data doesn't really show that it works that great. And actually, it has a tendency to create resistant organism. So that's why we don't do it. There's a note that I said, may consider IVIG. And really that's relating to um, somebody, we talk about immunoglobulin, possibly encapsulated um, bacteria. That will play more role here in patients who are on prolonged immunosuppressive, <coughs> who are on chronic GVHD. Now they're at risk for strep pneumo. So now if their IVIG level your globin is less now, right? So you don't have the properly neutralizing antibody. You may consider giving IVIG. Um, in terms of impregnated central line, central line, not live, um, to prevent central line associated bacteremia, stream, uh, bloodstream infection. Well, a consideration. I mean, in dialysis patient, we know there essentially what it is is antibiotic, antibiotic lock therapy. We see it in dialysis patient. You know, there's some data there for, you know, tr stem cell transplant using combination of minocycline, a very diluted minocycline, rifampin. Rifampin, as you know, has a t uh, uh, biofilm activities, which usually happens uh, when some of these organisms are there. So moving on, viral, CMV, right, owl's eyes, yes. Um, it's a big one. I mean, this in itself is really a full-blown lecture or two. And here I am trying to summarize it in essentially one slide. So, well, how I look at it is being simple-minded, I say, look, if somebody's CMV negative, I don't want to give them CMV. So give, if I'm going to give blood product, give them CMV negative blood product, or at least leukocyte reduced uh, blood. If they're CMV negative, I'm going to prophylax them. With what? Again, cyclovir, although we often use high dose acyclovir or about acyclovir, oral purpose. And we prophylax them for at least um, 100 days from time of uh, initial engraftment. And we, what do we do? We can uh, usually recommend we do screening, either PCR or you know using PP65 antigen. antigen. Now, the question becomes, ah, you do all this screening, and it's positive, and it's like 100, 200. What do you do? I don't know. I mean, it all depends on the, th our, the threshold each institution sets up. And then ultimately, you got to look at the patient. I mean, if you're thinking that this is not shedding but actually causing clinical disease, then yes, you may treat. And if you do decide to treat, y you commit the patient to two weeks minimum, and then you follow the viral load. And as long as it's trending down, eventually undetectable, then you stop. Some says if you treat them, just keep them until at least day 100. So that's CMV. Now it's EBV. The big thing with EBV is post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, right? Who gets it? Patient with T-cell depletion. So usually patients who are uh, given um, T-cell antibodies, so anti-thymocyglobulin, -thymo right? And who gets those? A blue cord? and haploidentical. Why do they get that? Because they're at higher risk for, again, GVHD. GVHD is kind of like one of the theme here. So what do we do? PCR monitoring, same setup, right? You have this fancy technique that can detect, you know, individual number of virus copy. But what do you do? Do you treat a hundred, thousand, tens of thousands? Usually they say tens of thousands, 
Um, but again, you got to take within the clinical context of what is the patient presenting. Well, how do you treat? Well, it's usually a virus that gets reactivated because you're on so much immunosuppression. So the way to go about it is reduce the immunosuppression, if possible. Sometimes it's not possible. Then sometimes you might have to use rituximab. Well, who knows? So HSV. HSV, pretty prevalent. Acyclovir prophylaxis for everybody. Um, but there's that rare case that sometimes you know, you give them acyclovir and they still get it, and you think, oh, could this be resistant? Could there be some issue with the thymidine kinase? Maybe, but you gotta say, in, t in what patient population? Doesn't happen really often. It's those patients who are on chronically low dose of acyclovir, are intermittently getting treated, appropriately or inappropriately, and somehow you get it in HSV negative donor. And you start in conditioning, you continue until the engraftment resolve or until the mucositis resolve, or some say until at least 30 to 35 days after a stem cell transplant. And of course, you can always continue longer if there's somebody with a frequent history of HSV infection. Yeah, disseminate exhaustor, right? Two or more um, dermatome, Ugh, never any good. Airborne contact isolation. Um, I don't know, I, didn't, I mean, they got it here eight days after exposure, at least up to 21 days. If they have it, I mean, if you get, you know, post exposure prophylaxis in VZV negative, it's usually VZV immunoglobulin, either IM or IV, or sometime IV immunoglobulin. You try to vaccinate all family members. Okay, again, you want to decrease the chance that you can transmit it. Um, and then you put in anybody who's VZV positive, which a lot of people are, you're going to put them on a cycle for at least a year and possibly even longer. Some say at least or until at least six months from when after all immunosuppressive have been stopped. So that could be years. Community respiratory viral, com respiratory community viruses, a lot, right? RSV, adeno, entero, et cetera. The big one I'm just gonna look at is really just influenza. Vaccinate, 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 right? Vaccinate all your household contacts. You know, healthcare providers should be vaccinated. Um, drop in standard precaution if they get it, and consider a possibility of even putting on something like acetamivir for a couple of days as a chemoprophylaxis in like a community outbreak in patients who are less than 24 months after transplant, or shoot, even more than that if they're on high dose immunosuppression. Okay, we're getting along now. Moving along to fungal infection. Canada is a common one. We know fluconazole is a drug of choice. But we also know that it's not effective at all, um, not greatly anyway, against Glorbrata at all against Cruze. Optimal duration, as usual, we don't know. Do we, you know, when do we stop? Sometimes you stop after the neutropenia resolve, sometimes you continue up to 75 day post-transplant. What is it based on? Their patient's risk factor. Did it have fungal infection before or not? Well, do you have other options? You know, because we know fluconazole has a lot of drug drug interaction with a lot of some of these, you know, immunosuppressive, serolimus, tacrolimus, et cetera. Well, mycofungin is an alternative. And the plus side is it'll cover your Grobrata and it'll cover your Cruze. Downside, it's IV. Mold. Oh, everybody's worried about mold. The common one are Aspergillus, Mucor, Fusarium. There's always Rhizopus. Rhizomucor, etc. Prophylaxis, usually with a, one of the azol, Vori or Posa. Keep in mind that Vori doesn't really have any activity against your mucor. Um, keep in mind, well, I mean, prior to the pill form of Voriconza, the suspension, you have to really eat, you know, um, high fatty meal. Not so much now. Again, a lot of unknown, right? Optimal duration. When, you know, once you put them on, when do you stop? D you know, Sometimes you keep them on if they're on high dose immunosuppressive therapy on bad GVHD. So, <coughs> other. Well, really, I'm just focusing on toxo and TB. Toxo, um, again, if you refer back to, if you can imagine it, toxo doesn't really happen to around mid of phase two. So now you're beyond two to three weeks from initial day zero of the transplant, um, and. Drug of choice usually is TMP, uh, trimethoprene, sulfamethazole, but you can also use atovacoin, dapsone, or aerosolized pentamidine. Uh, 
I don't know much, but I know I used aerosol life and on one patient, and she couldn't tolerate it all. Bad GI nausea upset the whole works. Now, the wonderful thing about Bactrim, essentially, is you also got other, get coverage for other organisms, nocardia, certain enteric, certain, some respiratory pathogen, um, and urinary pathogen as well, too. TB I kind of threw in there because not so much, um, as you can see, in turn from a hematopoietic stem cell transplant, more so an SOT. Um, the data says 10 times less than after SOT. But when it does happen, if it will affect patients who are leukemic, patient getting total body radiation, chronic GVHD, of course, allograft recipients. What do you screen? Who do you screen? Well, you know, healthcare worker, patient who are in an endemic area, you screen with um, immuno, you know, immuno, uh, yeah, yes, IGRA, yeah, blank it out. Um, and you would treat usually um, latent with INH or B6. Okay, here we go. Last slide, well, second to last. So now we're getting to essentially the summary. So really, only three take-home points, right? Point number one, infection, duh, it really kills people. In patients who are getting stem cell transplant, can cause a lot of morbidity. What are the risks? The risk is gonna be based on two things, right? Time from transplant and what kind of immunosuppressive regimen they're on. The higher the immunosuppressive, or the earlier the time of transplant, the higher the risk of infection. And finally, of course, everything should be patient-centered, right? I mean, that's what we do, right? And it should be evidence-based, because it is true, right? When you look at it, you say, well, a lot of these optimi um, duration, optimal durations are unknown, because there's no data. It all depends from patient to patient. You know, this is such a specialized group of patients that you can't have a blanket statement that covers everything, right? So. On that note, thank you so much for taking the time out and uh, listening to my ranting. As it says, questions are always guaranteed in life. Answers aren't. I'll open up the floor. Hopefully I'll have some answers to some of your questions. Thank you.